Welcome to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. G'day, my name is Trevor. I'll be reading the Bible for us today. And I'll be reading the passage that Rachel has just excellently described for us. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be using um, pictures and a felt board. Um, so I'll be reading from John chapter 18, beginning at verse 28. If you have one of the church Bibles, that's on page 1085. So that's John chapter 18, beginning at verse 28. Then the Jewish leaders took Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanness, they did not enter the palace because they wanted to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, they objected. This took place to fulfill what Jesus had said about the kind of death he was going to die. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked, or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth? retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews gathered there and said, I find no basis for a charge against him, but it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of the Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? They shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in an uprising. Thanks Trevor, hello everyone. Good to see you, hello online. It's great to have you with us today. I hope that you've had a week where you have somewhat thought, uh, dried out after uh, the busy uh, and flooded week uh, that we have uh, had. Now, let me give you a tip off. I often do the work for you by putting on the screen the Bible passages. I'm not going to do that today because I think we're now allowed to use the Bibles. So please go and get a Bible because I'd love it if you have that open in front of you as we, uh, uh, as we go. There's the community announcement for it and I'm going to pray. Uh, dear Lord and Father, help us to look into your word today uh, and into the trial of Jesus Christ. Yet help us to be careful, for uh, it may be ourselves who stand on trial, not Jesus, as we look at what is described in this passage. Amen. Well, have you heard about cancel culture? Does that sound familiar? It's a bit of a, a thing at the moment. We use can, uh, the, the idea of cancel culture. It's the form of activism that, uh, that happens when you try and shut a person out. Uh, it is sometimes referred to as call-out culture. Uh, and it happens when a public figure, usually a celebrity or perhaps a, a politician, says or does something that is deemed offensive. The backlash attempts to force the person out of the space so that they no longer have a voice. To call, uh, the call to cancel a person usually happens through various forms of media, particularly social media, uh, and what it involves is boycotting their work or calling upon their employer to sanction them, uh, banning products that are endorsed by them, which are all attempts to discredit the person in the minds of public opinion so that their influence uh, is shut down. 
Uh, we saw that a little while ago for those J.K. Rowling fans, those who like Harry Potter. J.K. Rowling put out a couple of tweets that took uh, that a particular sector of our community took issue at, and so they very quickly jumped and said, boycott all of the Harry Potter books uh, in all sorts of different ways. That is cancel culture. Cancel culture has a strange rel relationship with the idea of truth. There is often substance behind what they're pushing for, and uh, that can be a good thing, uh, but trying to work out what the truth behind whatever is being claimed can be a more of an art than a science. Any activism has a relationship with truth. You wouldn't step up to act on behalf of anything if you didn't think there was some truth behind it. What it does is it locks onto an ideal and then it works to establish that truth, whether there is any basis in it or not. And very often what happens is it's the emotion that starts to drive the, uh, the action and it starts to take on a life of its own. Cancel, cancel culture may be a new expression, but it is far from being a new idea. What I want to do is look at a passage today that shows the first century version of cancel culture. And we see it at the trial of Jesus. Welcome to the start of our Easter series, Famous Last Words. We've named it as such because we're coming to the end of John's Gospel and we're coming to a part where we see lots of people uh, interact with Jesus for the last time. They have seen what he's done, they have heard what he has said, many have believed and have followed him, which is wonderful, yet many have taken issue, which is not so wonderful. And throughout this whole gospel, Jesus has talked a lot about truth. It wasn't very popular when he raised it, and in some cases, he's pushed all sorts of buttons. What I thought might be helpful uh, is as you are opening up John chapter 18, that I might give you a little bit of background uh, to the passage that we're going to be looking at today. Because in this passage, the question, what is truth, is asked, not by Jesus, but by the one who will ultimately send him to the cross, by Pontius Pilate. Now, while you're finding it, let me give you the background. The idea of truth has been a bit of a feature in this gospel. In the first chapter, it tells us that truth has come through Jesus Christ, chapter 1, verse 17. And so, as readers, as we open up this, ver uh, open up this book, we can decide for ourselves by looking closely at what He says and does. And we can then work out, is this something that I think is true or whether it's something that is not? And as we read, we find that Jesus constantly asserts that he, what He is saying is true. In fact, 27 times in the 21 chapters of this book, He has used an expression that we've heard over and over and over again in this series that we've been working through up until now. Do you know what that saying was? Uh, I am, that was the series. But there's an expression, very truly I tell you, or truly... Uh, very truly, I tell you, if you have an older translation, uh, translation, it will say, I tell you the truth. 27 times, chapter 3, verse 1, he says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Chapter 5, verse 24, he says, very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. Chapter 6, verse 47, he says, very truly, I tell you, the one who believes has eternal life. I'm not going to go through all of them, you'll be pleased to know. They are all outright statements. And you could say they are representative of Jesus' high opinion of himself. The truth that he puts forward is there so that people can challenge it. They can consider it themselves and that's exactly what they do. Now, what we know as readers who have been able to open up this book of the Bible and, and examine it ourselves uh, is that this gospel has had a plot evolving 
to remove Jesus, to cancel his voice. They've accused him of blasphemy and then they've moved to stone him. We saw that in chapter 10. And then they developed a full-blown plot to kill him in chapter 11. And now we get to chapter 18. That plot is completely developed. And so it should be absolutely no surprise to us that at the beginning of chapter 18, he gets arrested. And so we come into this chapter with Jesus standing before the high priest uh, being questioned. And you can see that if you look at verse 20, uh, that there is absolutely no secret behind what Jesus has been doing. And he makes that point by saying that what he has taught, uh, all of those, all of the highlights of what he's been doing has been out there in the open. He's been in the synagogues, he's been in the temples, and the, and the high priest, if he wanted to check out what he'd been saying, presumably he hasn't heard any of it firsthand, that he, all he needed to do was listen to any of the many, many people who had heard and seen what he'd been doing. Either way, that hasn't pleased the high priest. And he is bundled off to the Roman governor, poor Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate ends up in our creeds and for uh, ever since this uh, has been proclaimed by the church as the person who has called judgment upon uh, upon Jesus in all sorts of different ways. What unfolds, uh, as we saw in the kids' talk, uh, is really an absolutely remarkable story. Would you follow it with me as you look at the text there? Go from verse 28. It's early in the morning and it's also the time of the Passover festival. So, interestingly, uh, if we were at the same time now, given that Easter is next week, it'd be in the, in the days ahead where we were celebrating the Passover festival if we were descendants of the Jews. And so these religious leaders, they don't want to enter into the gentle, Gentile palace of the Roman governor because it would mean that they were ceremonially unclean and wouldn't be able to celebrate uh, the, the Passover as they religiously think were, was important. Now, I hope you can see the irony here. The Passover remembers a time when God saved His people from from Egypt and that involved them sacrificing a lamb and spreading its blood across the doors so that God's judgment would jump over them. And that's all accounted for us in Exodus 12 and following. That is the festival that they celebrate in this period of time when God passed over judgment over all of those who were covered by the blood of the Lamb. Now, those religious leaders are handing Jesus over like a lamb to the slaughter, yet they don't see the significance of what they are doing. So the Roman Roman governor comes out and asks the leader, what charges are you bringing against this man? They don't bring any charges. They answer, verse 30, well, if he were not a criminal, would we have handed him over to you? Now, can you imagine, Andrew's a lawyer, can you imagine standing in a court of law and the, and the judge says, okay, tell me what is the charge brought against this particular purpose? Per- per- and, and here's what the answer is. Oh, you don't need to know the charges. You just to know, need to know that we brought him here, so that should be good enough. So what you need to do now is convict him. That sounds outrageous, doesn't it? It's a very funny kind of accusation. That is cancel cancel culture. Try and say that a few times. Uh, That is cancel culture. What you do is take this guy, trust us, deal with him so that we can silence his voice. Now, it's worth noting that at this stage in John's Gospel, Jesus has not been found guilty of anything. He has not hidden, he has not run, he has taught publicly, he has upheld the government, he has, ha- uh, he has come by his own steam to Jerusalem and he has willingly come when arrested. So Pilate says, sure, if he's a criminal, then judge him by your own laws. Now, that extracts the deeper motivation behind what the leaders are asking here and it betrays what they really want. 
We have no right to execute him. That's why we brought him to you. Now, I'm not a lawyer, so maybe, Andrew, you need to correct this for me. But my thinking was that when you walk into a courtroom, the idea is you go in under the presumption of innocence before you are declared guilty. And then if you are declared guilty, then you work out what it is that should be the penalty for that guilt. Is that the way it works? That, that, okay, I thought that was right. And yet, can you see what's going on here? We don't have a law that will bring out the outcome of the result that we want, so we are giving them to you so that you can bring about that result. Talk about a hospital pass. Pilate goes back into Jesus and mockingly says, are you the king of the Jews? Now, we've been looking at the I am resurrection, uh, the I am statements in, uh, in John, and after everything we have seen Jesus say about himself and everything that he has done, what do you think would be the answer? What's the expected answer? Oh, maybe this is just me, but when I read that and I hear a question like, are you the king of the Jews? I sort of expect him to say, I am. And yet he doesn't. Jesus puts the question back upon Pilate. Is that your idea? Or did others talk to you about me? That exposes Pilate's issue. Who is he listening to? Is he someone who can make up his own mind based on what he sees, what he hears? Or does he have to listen to the voice of all of the others? His call is, weigh it up. Now, it's probable that Pilate is trying to work out if Jesus is a political threat. Pilate is under Roman rule, where Caesar is declared to be king. If he, gets, uh, if he loses control... Of, uh, of what is going on in, 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 in the society he's responsible for, Caesar can remove Pilate quite easily, and so if he cannot keep rest, then he cannot do his job. And so it would make sense that what he is concerned about is that what Jesus is leading is a rebellion of some form that's going to unsettle. And so it's worth working out if he is surpassing or supplanting Caesar as king. Is Jesus starting an insurrection? Pilate indignantly responds, Am I a Jew? And points out that if Jesus was the king of the Jews, then what a king you are, because it's your own people who are handing you over and condemning you, verse 35. So Jesus answers in verse 36, My kingdom is not of this world. In other words, yes, I am a king, a king of the Jews, but I am not a political threat because my kingdom is not from here. If it were, then my servants, uh, as he refers to there, I suspect that's his disciples or his followers, if I were a threat, then they would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. And as you can see, that clearly has not happened. There is no rebellion here. Pilate exclaims, well, so you are a king then? And Jesus answers, well, you say I am, so let me tell you the reason why I'm here. It is to testify to the truth, and anyone on the side of truth listens to me. Now, this claim to kingship with the authority that, that, that it suggests, is a recurring theme throughout chapter 18. If you are somebody that marks your Bible and writes right through, go and circle all of the references to Jesus being king, and you'll see it comes up over and over and over again. As we read through the Gospel, in fact, as we read through the Bible, it is testifying to Jesus as king. It is presenting what was said about him and what he said and what he did, and what happened to him, so that, as if we were on trial, we can come with all of the evidences and make an informed decision about whether we think this is true or not. 
Here in this trial, Jesus has come to testify to that truth. And so, so Pilate's response, verse 38, what is truth? Now, I don't know the tone of voice that he would have used there. It's a bit hard when you're reading a document to work out what the tone of voice is without any sort of commentary on that one. But I wonder whether it's him just being cynical. <laughs> what is truth? Can't establish truth nowadays. You know, what, I, I don't know what the voice is that he's using there. But either way, he's not really interested in the answer because he doesn't even wait for Jesus to respond. He just leaves. And he goes out to the Jewish leaders and he says to those who are gathered, anxious that he's going to bring what they want them to do, and he says, I find no basis for a charge against him. That is the first of three declarations. You only need to read another few more verses and you will see the second and third declaration from Pilate that Jesus, that there is no fault that he can find with Jesus. I love the movement in this chapter and I think we saw that in the way that Rach, uh, Mrs Connor did such a wonderful job uh, of, of uh, running this, uh, th this kids talk because you see that movement from Pilate as he runs out to, to the Jewish leaders because they can't of course come in, he's too impure and listen to what they say, then he runs on into Jesus and he hears what Jesus says and he's all right, so he then runs on back out to, to the Jewish leaders and then you know, it doesn't get what he wants there, so if you keep reading, he then runs back into Jesus and, and says what he, and then he has to run back out to the Jewish leaders, and it, it goes back and forth. The geography of this particular passage is, is, is lots of fun. Uh, and it's like John is trying to show you that Pilate is caught in the middle. He is stuck between the world and Jesus. And he needs to make the decision between either. Both cannot be right. That is truth. Perhaps there is a way out of this for him. It is the Passover. And so, as a nod to Jewish custom, each Passover, the Jews were granted the release of one prisoner, presumably a Jewish pr prisoner, and so, as the Romans recognised the history of the Jews and the history of their Passover and the fact that God passes over judgment, then at Passover, what they do is they offer up a criminal and pass over judgment. So, give them a free card. And so, Pilate thinks, okay, well, what I can do here is I can offer one uh, and see whether this sort of fixes the issue and there, there's no problem there. Can you imagine the surprise that he got when they asked for Barabbas, a political prisoner, an insurrectionist? And I assume you can see the irony in that, can't you? That Pilate's original concern was that Jesus was a political threat and would cause an uprising. And now he finds himself with an innocent man in his palace and a crowd asking for a convicted insurrectionist to go free. That would be like rubbing salt in open wound. And what is so remarkable with that is that the Jewish leaders themselves have not seen that they were so concerned with their worldly festival, their worldly Passover, that they've just given up their heavenly Passover. Right, let's talk about truth. Pilate's question, what is truth? It remains open-ended and it still rings today, calling for an answer from each person that comes to look at Jesus. One of the beauties of a book like this is that we can make up that mind as we look at it. A truth by its very nature calls 
to be a, uh, calls to be based on facts, or, or it calls you to look at what is before you so you can make a determination whether something is right or whether something is wrong. Listening to witnesses, weighing up evidences. Our rule of law does that until it reaches the point where you can establish beyond reasonable doubt that someone is now guilty. Our academic institutions do that because we are asked to base our arguments on quoted, verifiable sources, and if we don't, we're marked down. And our medical standards are authorised on tested results. If they weren't, we would have had a COVID vaccine a very, very long time ago, and there'd probably be a lot more sick people, because they would have been the result of whatever that vaccine did. There's a reason why it took a while for that to be tested. And that is truth. What it does is it establishes something that is right and something that is wrong. A couple of my kids get spelling words each week. It will not help them if they spell it wrong for me to say, you can spell it any way you like. Because come Friday, when that spelling test is on, they will get a big bat X. There is a right way and a wrong way. And if that is the case, then with truth, it should shape the way that we live and the way that we act. That is, by examining Jesus, perhaps by looking at the facts, listening to the witnesses, weighing up the evidences, there is good reason to see the merit that he claims, the merit that he offers. He came into the world to testify to the truth and everyone who is on the side of that truth listens to him, as he says there in verse 37. Pilate in this story is a tragic figure who shows himself to be someone caught in that, that, that tension between what is right and what is wrong. And he shows you the problem when you come to look at Jesus. You cannot hold him to be false and him to be true at the same time. To reject Jesus, to cancel him out, bears less on him and more on the person who ignores that which appears to be established. And the tragedy is that what Jesus offers is then lost to the person. So it's all well and good to say, let's establish something that is true so that it's good for them. But in this case, establishing what is true is actually good for the person that understands that truth. The person on trial in John 18 is not Jesus, it's Pilate. And the question that he has to answer is this, who should he listen to? The voice of the crowd or the voice of Jesus? And in reading the Gospel of John, the person on trial in John 18 is not Jesus. It is us, the reader. And the question that we have to answer is this. Who should we listen to? The voice of the crowd or the voice of Jesus? So what's the take-home question? I'd love to be able to say, okay, what's the take-home message here? Uh, what is this calling us to do? Go out and celebrate a Passover, but a heavenly version. Well, we'll get to do a Passover this week, it's called Easter, that's great but I don't actually think that's the imperative of this particular passage. I think there's a question that this passage... I think that's the take-home for us this week. 
Given the number of times in John 18 that Jesus is referred to as King, I suggest that the question for us to dwell on today is this, is Jesus your King? Is Jesus your King? Now, we'll answer that differently depending on who you are and whatever circumstance we might be in. If He is your King, then here is my follow-up question. Does He have the authority of a King in your life? Because everyone on the side of this King listens to Him. That makes sense, doesn't it? A king has subjects and the subjects live in accordance with what the king or queen has determined. And so to be a subject of the king, you sit under that king's command. And so it's all well and good to say, yes, 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 I acknowledge the king. The question I think that John 18 asks those who know the king is are you willing for him to have authority over your life so that you just don't cancel out the things that you don't like and you pay attention to what it is that he is asking of us? Now, if you're someone who isn't sure whether Jesus is king, then the follow-up question to that is, is still the same question. Should he have authority as king over your life? Because to, be, to become a subject of that king, you will need to know that you'll have to listen to him. We're going to look at the next part of chapter 18 as we move into our Easter weekend of this Thursday. I'm hoping that everyone around our parish will join on Thursday night as the only time when all of our congregations are called into the one spot. And we're going to be looking at the next part of what happens to Jesus in these final hours or days and then hours of his life. Perhaps that might be a good time to recognise what Passover has happened for us. Let me pray. Dear Lord and Father, Truth by its very nature needs to be established somewhere. And if that is by you, we ask that you would help us to value your truth. You have given us, Jesus, not just to speak the truth, but to be your truth. And so we ask that you would help us to come to him and sincerely, carefully, objectively, make up our minds to sit under his authority as king. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You have been listening to a Bible talk from Lower Mountains Anglican Church. If you'd like to know more about Jesus, get further information or download other resources, please visit our website at lmap.org dot au